Hello. Just a, this is the first time I've spoken to a group since maybe 10th grade, so if you hear my voice wobble and waver as though it wants to shoot through the skylight and live on the moon forever, I apologize in advance for that sudden silence. Yes, and I additionally am very nervous and am very conveniently uh, and topical to our talk, uh, I'm having a really intense chronic illness flare today, so yes, this will be really interesting for you all, I hope. You see me suddenly lean on this table, I'm not just trying to strike a cool pose, it's because I, I need it to not <laughs> fall. Um, through so, the ground to the moon. Anyway, funny jokes. Hi, everyone. That's how video games work, by yeah. the way. If you fall through the ground, you pop up on the moon. Um, I'm Xander. Uh, I uh, have been dealing with uh, mental and physical health issues um, since I was very young. Um, and also, I make video games about that. I'm Kevin. I have been using video games as a way to connect myself to the world in a way that feels good for a long time, but it wasn't until recently that I made the connection between the way that I experience games, which always felt different as accessibility problems uh, that I just wasn't recognizing. Um, so yeah, so we're going to be talking a little bit uh, about uh, ways that and are not accessible. Or microphones. Yeah. Uh, for instance, uh, captions like that. That is extraordinarily helpful. Uh, it seems like often it feels like an afterthought in games. It's getting a little better, but the uh, common theme you might notice is just making things optional, able to be changed or altered. Uh, if you don't have the resources to do it, to make it easily altered by an outside program, such as a screen reader. So you'll want to use fonts that, although they might not be as fun as thematically appropriate fonts, you want to make them readable, legible, uh, high contrast, so that, and then timed well to what's happening and relevant and proofread. I'm often surprised at games with a $700 million budget that don't know where apostrophes go, but <laughs> that's just me. Um, so <coughs> additionally, uh, things, more things within game mechanics, um, such as making like extreme dexterity things um, should be optional and not mandatory, especially for parts of the game that are just part of the story. Um, yeah. Uh, it, <laughs> It, there's a curse that will not go away where in order to make the story sequences more exciting button prompts appear and you just acknowledge that there are buttons and you hit them and the story continues. Uh, this should be reflected, if you must put this in the game, uh, A, I don't really know why, B, make sure that it is reflected in the difficulty options or just optional because it doesn't really relate to the game proper, and that's often a stumbling block, is you can have the most accessible game design you can imagine, and then it, during a story sequence, you will fail, and you cannot continue. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so that leads us right into uh, speeds and difficulty options. Yes. Uh, and I feel like oftentimes people don't think about um, sort of the ways that they assume like, oh, okay, if this, if I, I can have this speed for a game and this will be fine for players, but you're not really considering vast levels of people. Right, and th this, th again, should be thought of early in the game making process so that you can have the infrastructure there to account for changing these variables or making them changeable later. Uh, and this can cover a broad range of disabilities because not only do you have trouble interacting with the game physically, it can cover cognitive things as well. If you have trouble processing a lot, just making the game slower often is all you really need to do. And uh, that's probably very complicated math, uh, but it, it just taking the time to make that variable will help a lot. Uh, 
additionally, something really, really simple um, that has also been wonderfully implemented at this conference is trigger warnings. Um, what may not be triggering for you may be triggering for someone else. And that can be in terms of anxiety or depression or post-traumatic stress disorder, um, but also physical, physical disabilities um, and health issues, uh, seizure warnings. Um. Yeah, the seizure warnings are an interesting one in that many, in order to pass a certification, which means you will have your name published, it will come with a standard seizure warning, which means it is one of the things you skip at the beginning and means nothing because it applies to all games and you don't know when it's going to occur, it just tells you that it might happen, which isn't super useful, probably to the people that need that warning. So Yeah, so being specific with, with what you're doing in your game, whether that be flashing lights or you know some sort of moving thing. <laughs> Sorry, still nervous. Um, so, yeah, we've had some examples. Sure, just a couple examples from different ends of the spectrum. Um, on the more familiar, people familiar with Mario Brothers, the more recent games have an option where if the game detects you're having trouble with it, it gives you the option to skip that sequence, and it does not judge you for it, does not make fun of you for doing that. It is also optional, it just appears, and you can choose it or not. The game will play itself out, or it will show you how to do it, or it will skip you past it entirely, or it will give you a, an item that allows you to go through whatever the challenge is. So there isn't a sticking point. I think that's a good uh, compromise. Uh, another example on the other end is the Bayonetta series of games, the most recent of which uh, oh, so sorry, we're Yeah, well, I often wonder how that appears. Oh, look at that, uh, on the captions. Uh, anyway, it, that being a more a hardcore, whatever that means, gamer's game is very, in, a lot of things happening all the time, very dynamic, exciting action game, but it has an automatic mode baked into the lower difficulty modes. It's not called something demeaning, and it allows you to perform the same actions that an incredibly high level skill quote unquote skilled player would be able to do and get through the game and get the same experience, uh, which means that it can be played and enjoyed by more people. And I think that's great. Whatever I think about the rest of the game is irrelevant. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and there are so many more aspects of uh, games mechanics we could talk about, but there's uh, other parts of the talk we would like to talk about. Um, so we super recommend uh, a really wonderful website um, that is a project of the Able Gamers um, Foundation, I believe, and it's called includification.com, and they have a guide to actionable game accessibility. Uh, Things yeah. you can do, yeah, yeah. Uh, broken <laughs> down by, seemingly by uh, how difficult it might be to implement uh, and the different people that would be helped with those right. implementations. And um, it's broken down into different categories, such as mobility, vision, hearing, and cognitive. Highly recommend yes. anybody making a game, and even the small game, just for even just for things you might not have thought about. Uh, even a small game that you're just going to put up for free on a website, just taking the time to, for instance, make the controls configurable allows a wider range of accessibility uh, devices and programs to interface with the game. How are we doing? We are halfway. Oh, you're fast. Okay, cool. So yeah, which is important because we're halfway on down this piece of paper. Okay. <laughs> so uh, we also wanted to talk a little bit about representation. Um, there's a lot of tropes uh, about disabled people within video games, and they aren't really great uh, things that we want to perpetuate. Um, I'm just going to start off right with horror genre of games because there's a whole lot of awful stuff in regards to disabled people within the horror genre of games. Yeah. Um, a really common one is the creepy asylum, um, you know, and having a mentally ill person of some awful ableist term um, chasing you and trying to kill you. The, these are things that we do not want You'd to perpetuate. be surprised how prevalent that trope is in games 
that otherwise have no reason to feature any of these things. It just seems like an easy way to, oh, we need to add some tension to this part of the game so your character will fall through a skylight into an abandoned asylum where people still live, I guess, and are very angry with you for non-specific reasons. <laughs> and it just the idea that any visible deformity or mental problem is bad. You are evil. It's a video game, so you're probably murderous also and you don't like anyone who is near you. And this is just so lazy. If it weren't awful for obvious reasons, it's just, I think it is boring. Uh, I don't think there's anyone that's played more than four video games that hasn't gone to an asylum for no reason. <laughs> so, stop it. <laughs> Editorializing. Uh, uh, yeah, so, do you want to talk about Wolf? Oh yeah, so for some reason I keep coming back to Wolfenstein because it is, it is an example of many things, it just every societal issue you can imagine smashed into one product and sold. Uh, I'm going to, here's a, here's a bad example of something it does, which is perpetuate uh, the naming convention on the difficulty select screen, uh, which is carried forward from an ancient version of the game, which is basically it makes fun of you for choosing an easy setting and it tells you you're great in ways that, I, not to put too fine a point on it, if you choose the lowest one, uh, which is called Can I Play Daddy? It puts a baby bonnet on your cool guy. So, great. That is, I had trouble with the game on that setting, so nice. I feel awesome being reminded all the time. But on the other end of the spectrum, it does include a character who is paralyzed from a, an infection that is, it's not even directly a war injury, which seems almost forward thinking. Uh, and the other characters don't, it's, the character has a character and a purpose, is your superior, is capable, is included in all of the things that are going on in this game about shooting robot Nazis. Uh, but is it confined to a wheelchair for the majority of the game? And the other characters don't have a problem with this, it's just accepted, and the character can be a character. Does unfortunately fall into a trope that we're about to get into later, but for the majority of the game, it is an unusually good representation within that sphere of games. Yes, um, so with that, I'm going to talk about the trope of uh, someone losing a limb and then becoming this super powerful cyborg. Um, yes. Uh, also the power suit trope. Um, yeah, which shows up in places you wouldn't expect, like games set in 1914. <laughs> um, yeah, so that, that actually kind of brings us into like, okay, so can this be used as power fantasy? I think that it really depends on who this game is coming from. And yeah. also, this is something that we see so often. <laughs> like, it's just something that we see over and over, and I, I want game developers to do better. I want game developers to come up with more creative, uh, disabled characters that aren't just following the, the same thing over and over. Or just the plain shock value, which is then nullified immediately because the character doesn't actually have to deal with anything because, hello, Mad scientist, robot arm, power suit. I'm actually better now. So, yeah, so I, uh, last year, um, when I was really, really dealing with chronic pain in an intense way, uh, still am, but last year it was manifesting to the point of I was better at it, I could not move, um, and I, started using Twan because I was able to uh, use voice commands uh, as opposed to physically typing because I couldn't even type at that point. Um, so I started making games in Twine and I wanted to think about ways that I could make characters that were like me in these games um, because as a genderqueer disabled person, I don't really see a lot of media that has people like me in it. Um, Definitely not positively portrayed. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I wanted, I wanted to create characters uh, that were disabled and were creative without erasing their disabilities. 
Um, so what I came up with uh, was a game called Ceremony, which is a twine game about a group of disabled and chronically ill witches. Um, and they kind of use their magic to uh, hack various aspects of their existence. Um, it's important to say change, you know, like as opposed to curing yeah. or ignoring. Yeah. Um, so, for instance, I have a character um, who uses their cane uh, and has figured out ways to turn it into a flying broomstick. Um, there's another character who has a service dog that is a Cerberus. Um, stuff like that. And I, I totally believe that game developers can come up with creative ways to represent uh, to represent characters that aren't erasive. Yeah, just not leaning on the tropes also sometimes forces a more creative and therefore I think more interesting um, result. Uh, definitely think that although it can be fun to just think of replacing a problem with a better robot problem as very satisfying, it's a redemption narrative. Often it, I feel better just ha being represented in any way at all that isn't bad. It just feels good. It doesn't need to be a magical robot laser that solves all of your problems. It can just be a character in the game that the other characters know and respect. Yeah, the witches don't need to cast a spell that makes it so they can walk again. Um, they can still be who they are. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. I think that's all we have to talk about. <laughs> Thanks for listening to us. There's, there's obviously so much more I guess, to go into, but I think uh, a thing you don't hear very often about is, is the uh, mental uh, just stumbling blocks that make the game something you are fighting against. And if the thing is a challenge, even if the game isn't supposed to be challenging, it can still lead to people just feeling like they they don't belong, they don't have a way to experience it. So anything you can do from the very beginning to bake into your game a way to pass through any sticking spot will be appreciated by a percent of people that is significant. Yes, um, and if you would like a link uh, to that website I mentioned earlier, includification.com. Includification. You can see that on my Twitter, uh, which is at GlitteryAnimal. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm at KevSpace. Neither of us say super important things all the time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, as opposed to this, which is very important, obviously. So. Very qualified. Yes, uh, very qualified we both are. Okay, bye. Bye. <laughs>